Jonah chapter 4. Jonah, Jonah. Going to begin reading in verse 1. Now, I'm going to do something I don't normally do, and that is this. I'm going to, go, I'm going to assume you, most of us know the story of Jonah. Could, could, we, could we say that tonight? Uh, if not, read it. <laughs> um, it's really simple. God calls Jonah to Nineveh. Jonah runs the other way. God sends trouble in the form of a fish, a whale, swallows Jonah, spends three days, three nights in the belly of the fish, he gets discharged on the land. He gets another opportunity to obey God and go preach to the Ninevites. And he runs there and he preaches to them and a great revival takes place. Praise God. But it doesn't end there. You'd say, I thought that was a whole story. No, it's not. There's another part. And that's chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before Tar unto Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. One more verse, and this is kind of our text. Then said the Lord, doest thou well to be angry? Is it doing you any good to be angry? I'm not going to deal with the gourd and all of that. I'm going to stop here and preach on something tonight that I hope is a preventative message. Amen. But maybe not. Maybe it's going to hit the nail on the head tonight. Let's pray. Father, please bless tonight. I recognize my great need of thee. We all do. Lord, help us to learn from this passage of Scripture. I pray for a fresh filling of thy spirit. I pray you'd lead and direct my thoughts and words, and may your word go forth with power and clarity tonight. And Lord, again, I need you tonight. We need you to speak to us, and please, again, may we examine ourselves how we're doing in this Christian life. And may we not be like Jonah was here in these few verses of chapter 4. Help me now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, if you and I were to pen the book of Jonah, I, I know what you're saying. Wait a minute, preacher. The Bible's inspired. Uh, uh, you're, you're, I understand that. We believe the Bible's inspired, Amen. preserved. But you know, if we were to pen a story like Jonah, we would have most likely ended it in chapter 3. And the reason for that is because if you're like me, and I think we all have the same nature, we do, we're all of Adam, brothers and sisters, amen. amen. We like happy endings. Amen. I do. I like to smile at the end. We like grand and glorious finales. We love the grand finale on the 4th of July. That's what we like. We like things to end well. We like the things to end on a good note. We like when the hero beats the villain. Amen. amen. We like when the good guy gets the girl. And we like when the problems in people's lives are fully resolved. That's what we like. You know, we don't even mind stories where we see someone who's a good guy go into the a deep valley and, and uh, troubles and trials and so forth, difficulties, uh, but we like to see them always end as, vi as victorious, don't we? I mean, that's the way we like it. Conquerors, winners, whatever. And that's the way that this book of the Bible would have ended. If it ended in chapter 3. But it doesn't. It goes on to chapter 4. You see, if chapter 4 weren't there, we would miss some very valuable lessons about ourselves. Amen. About our own nature. Right. About the uglies that are deep within each and every one of us. You know, through Jonah, God reveals to us some things that we have to deal with in our own hearts. 
You say, I don't have to deal with anything. Oh, yes, you do. Pride is one thing if that's what you're saying. We often forget that the greatest mission that God has in this world is in our own heart. Don't ever forget that. So often we think God has a great mission in this world. Uh, uh, to, he wants to see people saved, and that's true. He wants to see people come to Jesus Christ as Savior, uh, and he wants all men to be saved, no doubt. But understand something, that is greatly dependent upon your heart Amen. and my heart. Amen. Someone once said this, the greatest mission that God has in this world is in our own heart. The greatest mission that man has in this world is in his own home. Amen. That's where it begins. So chapter 4, I would say, we could call it, if you don't mind it, if you don't mind me calling it this, the reality chapter. The uglies, if you will. You know, some people, perhaps we could say all of us, we don't like to live in reality. I'd rather live in my fantasy world. Everybody loves everybody. Nobody has any problems. We're all wonderful. And, there's, and praise God, everything's great. That's not reality. We don't like to face the real problems in our lives. We don't like to deal with the real issues in our hearts. We fear truly saving, saying to God what David said in Psalm 139, Search me, O God, and know my heart. We fear saying that. You know why? Because we know what he'll find. See, I like hearing preaching about things that's other people's problems. Amen? Well, I could say, yeah, that was good for him. Yeah, that was good for him. Yeah, that was good for her. But when it hits home, that's very difficult. Amen. So chapter 4, understand, reveals some things in Jonah's heart that ought not to be there, and God is going to deal with it. Amen. And so tonight I'd like to preach on this subject. I hope you don't mind the title because... I, I just think it fits this, and, and, and that is this. Beware of the spirit of Jonah. It's not a Halloween message. You know what I'm talking about. You know, if there's one thing that all of us can agree upon, is that Jonah was a highly emotional man. We don't have anyone like that in here, do we? I think we all are to some degree. Maybe not. You know, when Jonah did something, he did it all the way. I mean, up on the mountain, down in the valley, up on the mountain top, down in the valley. When he was going to disobey God, man, I'll tell you what, he was determined to disobey God. When he was going to repent, oh, my soul, he repented wholeheartedly there in the belly of that whale. Oh, God, forgive me. Oh, God, help me. Man, I'll tell you, there he is all out repenting. When he engaged in preaching, he did it passionately. When he finally got his heart turned around for God, he was passionate when he went into Nineveh and told them to repent. Amen. Then here in chapter 4, when Jonah's upset, unhappy, notice the wording in verse 1, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. When Jonah was displeased, he wasn't just a little bit down. He was exceedingly displeased. When Jonah got angry, it wasn't just he was a little bit bothered. Uh, uh, Jonah was very angry. Amen. He was a man that wore his heart on his sleeve. And here in chapter 4, he is in a dangerous state spiritually. His spirit was in a place where it ought not to be. And by the way, all of us can be there. And God's going to deal with him about it. And I want to ask you, do you have the spirit of Jonah? It's in every church, somewhere, sometime. It's in every family, somewhere, sometime. Let's consider this spirit of Jonah and be rare of it. Notice number one, if you will, please. The irony, the irony of Jonah's condition. It's ironic, isn't it? I mean, look what in verse 1, but it, it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. As we begin reading, I mean, we just read, uh, or we know the end of chapter 3. I mean, a great revival takes place, and as we read those words, uh, it shocks us. It's almost as if it comes out of left field. 
And, and it shouldn't be there. Why is it there? But it is. Uh, Jonah's unhappy. Jonah is bitter. Uh, Jonah's even angry. What in the world? I mean, he just held some meetings. He was the preacher in the meetings in the city of Nineveh. And the entire city turned to God. Uh, can you imagine that? I mean, imagine if I went out and preached a tent meeting and saw a revival. Man, I'll tell you what, I'd come back saying, wow, man, it was great. It was awesome. Uh, it was a wonderful thing. Uh, this should have been a time of joy in Jonah's life. It should have been a time of praising God. Uh, it should have been a time of spiritual enthusiasm because what God had done. But he's angry. He's mad. I mean, he should have been beside himself. His Facebook post should have went viral. Is that possible? I don't know. I know YouTube videos. Do, do Facebook posts go viral? Just say yes. You know what I'm trying to say. Yet we read, he is angry. He's a sour man. What an unexpected reaction. Can I say this? Hang around long enough and you'll find out unexpected, but more common than you might think. You know, we expect the world and the devil to be upset with revival. We do. We expect him to be upset with souls being saved. I mean, the, we wouldn't be surprised if the booze crowd and the gamblers and the pornographers and the abortionists and the liberals, uh, when they heard that God was working in people's hearts and things were changing, we would understand uh, that lost people and those types of people would get upset when people got saved and turned to God. Well, that's what happened in the book of Acts. People got upset. But to see somebody who's saved, to see someone who says they know God and love God and say that they believe the Bible and they're members of a good Bible-believing church, being, be, be in a state of anger and unhappiness and displeasure, or sour grapes, if you will, when God is working in the lives of people? Amen. Can I say, if that's your condition, something is deeply wrong with you spiritually. Something's wrong. You say, oh, nobody's like that. Yes, they are. G. Campbell Morgan once said this, Oh, brethren, how much of the attitude of Jonah is among us? Amen. You know, I think of our church. Uh, uh, God is doing some and has been doing some wonderful things in our church. Do you see it? Amen. Do we see it? Amen. Should I mention some things? I mean, we've seen so many people saved this year. I mean, dozens upon dozens of people have come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the, Lord. the land swap. Come on now. For, for decades, uh, it was said uh, uh, that would never happen. And here, God sees fit in his grace and his mercy and his timing uh, uh, to put it on the heart of the city of Dover uh, to do this with us. Uh, praise God for that. We've raised nearly $60,000 in just about six months to replace our HVAC system. That's amazing to me. Amen. Our mission's giving. Man, when I heard that number, you know, I, I, hallelujah, amen. I mean, the preliminary number's already above last year, and it keeps getting bigger. Attendance in our services have been wonderful. We're running out of Sunday school space uh, uh, for classes. Uh, our nursery is overflowing with babies. I was told uh, uh, one service not long ago, we had 13 in there. I shouldn't have said that. Bye-bye to any future wor uh, nursery workers. <laughs> well, that was, uh, you know, um, that wasn't normal. <laughs> My point is this. Every one of us in this building, every child of God, every person that is a part of Capital Baptist Church should be rejoicing in what God is doing. But are we? Are we all? You know, there's in every church, and again, I'm not aiming at anybody tonight. You may think I am, but I'm not. If you are, tell me who it is so I can, I can look at him when I preach. Please don't point right now. 
But you ever notice that in every church, no matter what happens, no matter, I mean, we could have a, a hundred people saved on bus ministry Sunday. We could have 200 on the buses. We could have a, a, a hundred thousand given the missions conference. And they always seem to find some reason to fuss or gripe or complain or to groan or to murmur and to be negative about things. It's like they're a black cloud. You know? And sometimes I want to ask people like that. Is there anything that will make you happy? Anything? I want to say, what has to happen spiritually for you to say praise God about what he's doing? What has to happen? You say, what's the problem? They got the spirit of Jonah. You know, it doesn't take a whole lot for that spirit of Jonah to come out. Just let the preacher preach on a message like this tonight. Spirit of Jonah is going to come out. Just let the preacher go over 10 minutes. And the spirit of Jonah comes out. Just uh, let the preacher stand up and ask people to give to another project or attend another meeting. And you'll find the spirit of Jonah come out. Some people, it just seems like they're always irritated, always displeased, always upset, always complaining, always negative about everything. It's the spirit of Jonah. It's ironic, isn't it? But it's true. Do you have it? It's not hard to find it. It's not hard to see it. It's written all over your countenance. It's seen when we get the hymn book, hymnals out and it's time to sing. And you don't want to sing. It's there. Amen. So we see, number one, the irony of Jonah's condition. Number two, the root. Of, what, what, what is the root of Jonah's condition? Well, Jonah decides, after we read in verse one, that he's exceeding displeased, and he's a very angry man. He offers, he spiritualizes himself by offering a lame-o prayer. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God, please. Please. His prayer reveals his problem. Amen. By the way, you can have the spirit of Jonah and walk around here like a Pharisee. Get up, and, and I'm, not, I'm not saying anything about our ushers, but I'm just saying get up and pray for an offering or pray for something and be the most eloquent prayer person in the entire congregation, yet you are filled with the spirit of Jonah. You're just a grump. Grump, that's the word I said, grump. Some of you look like you didn't understand. Grump, amen. <laughs> Crouch, cringe, call it what it will. But notice what he says in verse 2. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and great kindness, uh, and repentancy of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take I, be take I beseech thee my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. It's easy to figure out his problem. You say, how? Notice all the personal pronouns. Do you see them? Count them up. In two verses, he says, I, my, I, my, I, 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 my, me, me. That wasn't hyperbole. That's exactly what he said. Ten times in his short prayer, he mentions himself, which tells us that Jonah's anger, Jonah's displeasure, Jonah's grumpiness, Jonah's complaining, Jonah's murmuring, Jonah's sour grapes attitude was rooted in selfishness. Amen. Selfishness. It's interesting, and as I was reading some things about this passage, I came across an old, neat commentary I had, almost had me go and do a series on the book of Jonah. I was thinking about that. But at any rate, it's an 1875 commentary on Jonah, written by Stuart Mitchell, and it's entitled, listen to this, and this is why I say this, Jonah, the self-willed prophet. You say, how can a believer be self-willed? Ha, 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 ha. Are you kidding me? 
We, we, we can. You see, selfishness has no place in the work of God. Matthew 16, 24. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus said, you want to be a follower of me? You have to die to self. Self shall have no place in the work of God. It's not about you. It's about him. Amen. You know, think about this for a moment. A moment. Jonah was overjoyed when God gave him grace. He had no problem with it then. He had no problem when, he, when God gave him mercy, when God answered his prayer in the belly of the whale, when God forgave him, when God delivered him from the fish after he repented, he, he, had, uh, he rejoiced when God gave him a second chance. Amen. When God showed it to somebody else, he didn't like that. Why? Selfishness. Right. You see, selfish people are egocentric. They seem to think that the world should revolve around them and their experiences. When they open their mouths, it's about themselves. You ever been around somebody like that? I mean, everything's about them. I mean, it's about their problems. It's about their needs. It's about their wants. It's about their desires. It's about their feelings. It's about their health. It's about their hurts. It's about their aches and pains. It's about what they like, what they want, and what they desire. And it's always, oh, pray for me. I can't remember. Do, do, do normal people say that? Oh, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. That's not, I don't think that's a normal thing to do. People shouldn't actually pray for people, right? And I understand when there's a need, pray for this. But when it's all that, oh, pray for me, oh, pray for me, oh, pray for me. That's a person that's selfish. It's all about them. Even when they talk about others, uh, it's only as it relates to themselves and how they're involved. Why? It's all about them. And when it's not about them, the spirit of Jonah comes out. You know that churches can have the spirit of Jonah? You say, what do you mean by that? Some would rather see people remain lost than see another solid church in their town winning people to Christ. It's true. They'd rather see people not get the gospel than another church come into Dover and start knocking on doors. We should rejoice in that because they're trying to reach people with the gospel. Not what are they doing here? It's that place. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't realize we owned Dover. We don't own Dover. Thank God for anybody who's reaching anybody Amen. with the gospel. Praise the, Lord. Praise the Lord for that. But my point is this, that's the spirit of Jonah. Oh, when we say, well, if it's not us, we get upset. Church members can have the spirit of Jonah. Let someone else be the leader. And that person gets upset. How come I didn't get the class? How come I wasn't asked to do this? How come I'm not the one leading this up? After all, I've been here so long. I've been here this and that. I, on and on we go. You know what that is? That's the spirit of Jonah, my friend. Amen. Right. If it has to be you, if you have to be the leader, if you have to be the one in charge, if you have to be the one that heads up some ministry, then you have the spirit of Jonah. It's awful quiet in here. But it's true. I've seen people get bothered at this. Somebody comes in our church, they get saved, or they've been saved, and they get baptized, or they've been baptized. They join the church, and man, they're excited about the things of God. They grow in the Lord. They're faithful to services. They start winning souls. They get involved in the work of the ministry. They maybe even start teaching a class. And what you find in many people that have been sitting on their you-know-what for a long time is they have the spirit of Jonah. They get mad. They get upset disturbed. Let somebody else get recognized. Let somebody else uh, 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 get noticed. Let somebody else get the attention. Let somebody else get asked to do something you want to do. Uh, and watch what happens. The spirit of Jonah comes out in many. Amen. You know why the reason that some people can't be happy? 
is because it's really, when you boil it all down, it's not about God. It's about them. Yes. It's not about us. Amen. It's about Him. Amen. So we see the irony of Jonah's condition. We see the root of Jonah's condition. And thirdly and lastly, we see the result of Jonah's condition. Jonah was upset, but notice what we find in verse 4. Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? Amen. Do you know what God is almost, seems like he's saying here to Jonah? Jonah, is this spirit that you have really doing you any good? Is this spirit you have doing you well? Is this, is this helping the situation? Amen. You know, not all anger is sin. I think we understand that. Ephesians 4.26 says, Be ye angry and sin not. There are some things that should upset us. Amen. There are some things, uh, uh, things like uh, uh, sin and evil and wrong in this world uh, and injustices ought to upset us. There is such a thing, I believe, as moral indignation. God the Father expresses anger. Exodus 4.14, and the anger of the Lord was kindled. Jesus Christ himself expressed anger. Mark 3.5, he looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, and neither of them sinned. God the Father didn't sin, Jesus Christ didn't sin, but understand, Jonah's anger here was sin. Because it was rooted in selfishness. And if Jonah were honest with God, when God asked him that question in verse 4, doest thou well to be angry, he would have said, no. I'm not doing well. You say, why is that? Because the spirit of Jonah, that negative, that, that anger, that displeasure, that everything, that never being satisfied, uh, that idea that the best things could be happening all along in your life and in this church, and you find something to be angry and displeased about. Understand what that does. That doesn't do anybody good. Amen. Doesn't do anybody good. Matter of fact, it damages things. You see, uh, the spirit of being upset all the time, the, the sp spirit of being displeased with, with everything and never happy and always finding fault and always negative, no matter how great uh, things God is doing in this world, is a very destructive spirit. Amen. It'll destroy you. Amen. It'll eat you up inside. Can you find something to be happy about? Can you find something to rejoice about? Can you be happy when people get saved? Can you rejoice when this land thing goes through? Uh, can you rejoice when you see the missions and the uh, numbers go up? Can you be happy about that? Amen. You ought to be. Because that spirit of Jonah is going to eat you up. By the way, it's going to eat up your marriage as well. It's going to eat, your, it's going to eat up your family. It's going to eat up your children. It's going to eat up this church. It's going to eat up friendships. You say, why is that? Because nobody enjoys being around the spirit of Jonah. Nobody does. It's destructive. And beware of it. The truth of the matter is that spirit of Jonah <laughs> is right here in my heart. Just waiting to come out. If I'm not yielded to Christ, Amen. every one of us can have that spirit of Jonah. Amen. And I say tonight, let's rid ourselves of it. Amen. Because that's something that's going to destroy you, your family, and this church. Amen. Beware of the spirit of Jonah. Let's pray together.